it's time to talk about more applications. And um, a more grandiose title for this lecture might, might be Applications to Data Science. Uh, but I'm one of these detail people, and I figure it's not really fair to say Applications to Data Science if it's only going to be one or two particular applications. The author of the book doesn't feel that way. The name of the chapter is um, Data Science Applications. So I actually think about this uh, lecture, really, the, the center of it, the focus, is about curve fitting. Uh, and that's because of my, I guess, more mathematical and less statistical background, I suppose. Um, I think it's reasonable also to say that what we're going to do, the application we're going to use would be regression, which is uh, which involves curve fitting. Uh, and so we'll split the difference and, and title the lecture. I guess we'll, we'll put both things in the title. Uh, I, I think I'll talk about this in three parts. Um, Vanderbay's book in, in this chapter it starts with a really interesting introductory example, a nice appetizer that not only, I think, sets the tone really well, but brings up some interesting stuff that you may not have been aware of about means and medians. So, of course, um, I, I'm going to try and be relatively uh, notationally agnostic because I know that not everybody in this course has the same background in statistics. So I'll try and actually uh, actively avoid any statistical commentary. Um, but I know that all of you have at least some previous exposure to basic statistics in some first or second year course. And of course, you know what means and medians are. And there's this great introductory example, we'll jump right into it, um, which asks this question. Uh, from an optimization perspective, uh, Basically, uh, we have a collection, a data set, some collection of real numbers, so x1, x2, up to xn. Suppose that I want to choose some single value v that will be a representative for the entire set of data. Something about this value v has to capture the character of the entire data set. So the book uses the example, suppose that uh, we've just had an exam in the course, and I want to find some single number I could use to encapsulate information about how the class did on the exam. Now, those of you that know me know that I'm no, no big fan of handing out class averages for components because there's all sorts of weird mitigating circumstances. But I could say, here's the average grade, here's the median grade. And we know already, uh, both from whatever previous courses you've taken, but from culture in general, that often when you have data sets, it's pretty common to talk about things like the average of a collection of data as a way of encapsulating uh, information about the entire data set. And maybe you also already know that there are reasons why sometimes the mean isn't the best representative. Sometimes the median is instead. So without going into too much statistical detail, I want to talk about the difference between these two statistics uh, and also a really interesting way that they tie into optimization. And uh, I guess they also, the way that we're going to analyze that will uh, have some implications um, and be a nice uh, foreshadowing of how we're going to analyze and derive some stuff later in this lecture relevant to uh, linear programming, rel relevant to regression techniques. So uh, I want to choose a representative of the entire collection of my entire collection of real numbers, uh, and I want to call that representative v. What I want, I suppose, out of my representative is, in a sense, I want v to be as close as possible to each data point. I want it to, to in some way, minimize the error between my representative and each individual data point. This requires us, uh, of course, to define the error somehow. So we'll start with this. We'll dive right in and just, I guess, arbitrarily say, why don't we think about the error? So suppose I've chosen a value y as a candidate for my estimator. So it is a possible representative that I might choose. Uh, we'll define uh, for this particular value y and each of my data points xi, we'll consider this value here. We'll call this the squared error. So the error between our estimator and each data point, I think, is just the difference. So y minus xi, that is the difference between my estimate y and uh, each individual data point. The problem is, if I just use this, if I consider this as the error, and then I want to talk about the global error, so the error not just between y and xi, but the error aggregated among y and all of the data points, if I just use this difference, I might get myself into some trouble. So one of the issues is y could be above or below xi which means this quantity here could be positive or negative. If I want to consider the total error among all points, maybe I want to add together the error terms, I don't want a situation where I have negative errors and positive errors because then they might cancel each other out. They might um, inadvertently make it seem like there is very little error when in fact there is a lot. So one thing I could do, one, again, rather arbitrary choice, is I could say, how about this? 
for each data point, if you give me a particular y that you're interested in, for each data point, let's compute the squared error term. Let's take the difference between the data point and uh, the estimator and the data point and then square it. And we know that that result, of course, will be uh, zero or positive. There'll be no issue of negative error terms. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna decide that this is my measurement of error between an estimator and a data point. And now I want to find a particular value v to be my representative, and I want it to be the one that get, gives me the minimum uh, total squared error across all data points. In other words, specifically, I want, um, if I consider, if I define this function f of y, I want v to be a minimum of this function. So I want it to minimize the sum of the squared error between my representative and each individual data point. Uh, okay, so uh, just to be clear, I know it might seem a bit confusing that I'm talking about y and v. Uh, the issue here is that because I'm trying to minimize a function, I need that function to have a specific argument. And v is not meant to be its argument in general. V is the minimum that I'm looking for. So f of y, so f is a function that gives me the squared error of a particular estimator versus uh, compared to all of the data points. V will be the point that the minimum value of f. v will be an argument to f that minimizes its value. So an interesting uh, observation, something sort of bizarre actually, unless you've seen this interpretation before, is it turns out that the minimum value of f is attained at the mean. So if I'm choosing a representative that minimizes the total squared error across all data points, it turns out that the mean is that representative. Uh, the slides do contain a complete proof of this. Uh, I'm going to go through the proof at a high level. In all of this lecture, I'm not going to go into much detail about the tedious algebra because we've seen lots of, we've seen pretty much all manner of tedious algebra in this course already, but it is all in the slides if you want to look at it. So the exercise is prove that the minimum value, the global minimum of this function is attained at this value x bar, which is of course defined to be, the mean is defined to be the average of all data points. So it shouldn't be uh, it shouldn't be too um, hard to recognize that what we're doing here is just unconstrained optimization. And yes, this is a linear programming course, but there are some transferable skills that we've obtained over the semester, and one of them is how to work with unconstrained optimization problems. Um, although it's not a linear optimization problem, it's sort of almost linear, because if we think about how we solve unconstrained optimization problems, that is to say, take the derivative and set it to zero, the fact that this summation of uh, quadratic expressions, um, it contains, the only nonlinearity is that quadratic thing, is that square. We know that if we take its derivative, we're gonna end up with a linear derivative. And so we're going to find ourselves in a linear setting pretty quickly. The function is also differentiable everywhere, uh, which is helpful. So I can find the minimum of the function by setting the derivative to zero. And this is the place where I'm going to skip over some algebra. Basically, this is the derivative. And after a bit of rearrangement, we can end up arranging it to look like this. Setting, if I set the derivative to zero, I end up with this expression here. The derivative equals zero if... Uh, at points y such that this relationship holds. And then if I do a little bit more algebra, so I cancel the two from both sides and I move the n over here, I end up with the expression that the value I want for y that sets the derivative to zero is this thing, which as it happens equals the mean x bar. And that proves that x bar uh, will give, if I plug x bar into my function f up here, I will get the minimum possible value of f, which means that x bar is the best choice of representative if the thing I am trying to minimize is the sum of squared errors. On the other hand, why did I go right to squaring the error term? I mean, think about that. There are probably a lot of settings in which many of you in the past have had to uh, consider uh, the error between an estimator and some data, and maybe you've chosen to use squared error as well, or you've chosen to use root mean square or something else that involves squaring something. But why? Why did we use a square and not something else? Uh, we might notice that if we're squaring the error term, then the larger the error is, the more it's going to contribute to this summation. In a sense, that means that if we're looking at estimators that are far away from a particular data point, the error term for that data point will become a lot more significant than the error terms for other ones, because the larger the error gets, or as the error gets larger, the squared error, of course, increases quadratically. So that really shouldn't be the only interpretation we work with. So how about this one? So I said before that the error between a particular candidate estimator and a data point is just this number. And this number could be positive or negative. And we know that we'd really rather that we don't allow error terms to be both positive or negative, because if we choose to sum them up, we don't want a situation where a large negative error cancels out a large positive error and makes it look as if the error itself is low. 
But why did I have to square it? So squaring my error term had some advantages, one of which was that I'm guaranteeing that the result is going to be a zero or positive. And another one is that by squaring it, I'm getting a continuous function out of it. So that's helpful because if I want to differentiate to minimize, then I, I'm guaranteed to have something that's continuously differentiable. Um, but I also have this strange, maybe disadvantage, that if I square the error term, I am in a sense overrepresenting the error terms of, of data points that are far away from my estimate. So what if I try this instead? I say, I don't want negative error terms. Other than that, I don't want to artificially um, inflate the relationship uh, that I'm creating here. I don't want to square it. So why don't I just put an absolute value sign around this error? I'll call this the absolute error, as opposed to the squared error. So now I want to do the same thing. I want to choose a representative that minimizes this function. So I'm minimizing something just like before. The difference is I'm not minimizing squared error. I'm minimizing absolute error. And notice that, of course, obviously I could still have large error terms for some data points, but the error term, uh, the relationship between the error term and the distance from y to the data point is now linear, not quadratic. Uh, and so I want to see what is the global minimum of this function. And rather astonishingly, it turns out that um, the median it will actually attain the global minimum. Now, actually, I should be careful. I, I noticed just before I recorded, the way this is worded is a little bit too absolute. So um, it's not that V will always equal the median. I should actually say that the minimum will always be attained at the median. There could be other values. It turns out they'll be close to the median. There could be other values that also attain the minimum here. So sorry about that. That's sort of, uh, for the sake of the exercise, it makes no difference, but it is a little bit inaccurate there. It's, it's overstating something a little bit. Um, before we go on, I want to make an observation, which is that this is actually pretty astounding. So this has actually managed to tie together means and medians, assuming we can actually write this proof. This has managed to tie together means and medians in a very profound way. The mean, if I'm choosing an estimator, the mean is an estimator that minimizes this expression of error, and the median is an estimator that minimizes this one. And if, especially if you think back to how you were probably taught to compute means and medians, that's pretty profound. Because we don't think of means and medians, although they're both statistics about data sets, we don't really think of them as being congruent, as being similar. Um, an example being, if we approach this from a computer science perspective, you probably knew as of, I don't know, lecture number three in CSE 225, that if you want to compute the mean of a set of n data points, that's big O n. That's almost obviously big O n. Loop through them, add them up, divide by the number of points. Easy. If you want to compute the median of a set of data points, the naive way would require sorting them, which would be n log n based on what you might learn in CSC 225. You will eventually, you would eventually learn maybe later in CSC 225, much later, or in CSC 226, that indeed the median can also be computed in big O n time, but not by any technique even close to that for the mean. And, and in particular, computing the median always seems like it requires some type of sorting or something analogous to sorting, whereas computing the mean involves adding a bunch of stuff up and dividing. And we know that, yes, the mean and median are both descriptive um, statistics about a set of data, but it's pretty astonishing, at least to me, to see it presented this way, where if we view it as minimization problems, as optimization, we can now connect the mean and median very tightly in terms of basically, do I square something or not? That's pretty amazing. Now, how do we prove this? How do I prove that the, the minimum of this function will be attained at the median x tilde? So we can't do what we did before. We can't just differentiate the function f and I, I suppose you could say solve it when it equals zero because the derivative isn't continuous um, or more broadly, you could argue the derivative may not even exist at particular points. Um, and so we can still use the same argument. We, if we can find a point where the derivative equals zero or where we can infer that it would equal zero, so an example would be, I don't know, I'll sketch out here are my axes. It could be that at a particular point, the derivative is not defined. But what if I notice this? The derivative does something like this. It's reasonable to argue that at this point here, that the derivative was functionally equal to zero. Whether or not the derivative is actually defined at that point is sort of irrelevant, because if we can make certain assumptions about the derivative, that is to say, it has discontinuities, but maybe it's always, it's going to be monotonically increasing, we can reason about it in a similar way. We just can't solve equations algebraically the way we would otherwise. So the fact that it's not defined at certain points doesn't necessarily limit us here. We can still make the same arguments. Um, and again, for the sake of this appetizer, we won't 
dig too deeply into that, into the implications of that. But we can't just set, we can't just find the derivative and set it to zero. Okay, so why is the derivative problematic here? Well, the issue is if we consider the absolute value function, there it is, here's the point uh, x equals zero. The problem is that the absolute value function itself is continuous. Uh, however, if I consider the derivative, if I look at points where x is negative, the derivative, the, the function is decreasing, the derivative is negative one. If I look at points where x is positive, the derivative is one. What exactly happens at zero? Now, it depends on how you interpret it, but certainly there's a discontinuity there. We could define the derivative to exist or not at the point x equals zero. It makes no difference because in any case, we would have this situation where the derivative is negative one and then makes a sudden jump to positive one. Whether or not it stops at zero in the middle doesn't really help us. There's still a, a, a gap, still a discontinuity. Uh, so we can't just take the derivative and set it to zero. Now, to be clear, the absolute value operator does have a derivative, and it's this sine function, sine x. I, I, I didn't write a definition of that, but in case you're wondering, here it is. Sine x is the following. It's just, uh, if the value you pass in is negative, you get negative one. If the value you pass in is positive, you get positive one. So it's negative one if x is less than zero, positive one if x is greater than zero. And then depending on who you ask, it's either undefined at zero, or we just define it to equal zero. And to be frank, either interpretation would still get us what we want here, although I like this one, it's a bit more friendly. Uh, and that, it also is worth considering that that may not strictly match this description. If we assume the sine function equals zero at zero, then the derivative may well exist, but it's still discontinuous. So even if it exists, we still have a discontinuity that means we can't solve it algebraically in the same way we otherwise would. So what is the derivative? To the extent that it exists, when the derivative exists, it is equal to this. If you give me a particular candidate estimator y and you put me at a point that isn't equal, so if y is not equal to any particular point xi, if we're between data points, then the derivative will just be the sum of the sine function um, uh, of, this diff of this error y minus xi. And what I want to show is, we, we, although this function is not well behaved, it's well behaved enough that we can draw a, enough of a conclusion from it to figure out where the minimum is. And I'm going to try and draw that out, sort of, uh, I'll use the next slide to draw that out. Um, before I go any further, I also have to figure out what the median is. So you have given me a set of n data points, x1 through xn. At no point is it significant which data point goes where for the sake of this example. So I'm going to assume without loss of generality that they are sorted that x1, x2, xn are in ascending order. I'll rearrange them if I have to, to put them in ascending order. The reason I'm doing that is so that we can figure out which one's the median. Maybe the way that you were taught was that, okay, so let's just come up with the collection xi here. Here are my, sets, my set of points um, x. We'll start with, let's do uh, 3, 7, um, 8, 11, and 14. So five points. And they are in ascending order. If they weren't, without loss of generality, rearrange them to be in ascending order. What is the median? Well, probably the way you were taught is that if you put the points in ascending order, the median is the point that falls in the middle. So in this case, the median would be 8. But what happens, and that, that would be this situation here, if the number of points is odd. What happens if the number of points is even? So what if I have a 1 here? Well, in that case, the median is apparently whatever's in the middle, which is sort of halfway between two numbers. What we're about to prove, it turns out, although it's not the point of the proof, what we're about to prove is that any value between 7 and 8 actually is the minimum of uh, this function here. But for the sake of defining a single thing to be the medium, typically, uh, typically what is done is we define the median to be whatever the sort of invisible point halfway between the, the, the two points in the middle. So in this case, the median would probably be 7.5. So the median does not actually have to be a member of the set uh, of points, nor does the mean. Um, so now that we have the points in ascending order, we can actually define the median relatively concisely. We can also, with this ordering, uh, figure out what the actual value of this summation of the sine function is. And instead of uh, working through the cases algebraically, I'm going to draw an example uh, because, again, the point of the appetizer is to talk about the techniques we're going to use, not to scrub through algebra because we'll have tons of time to do that later in this lecture. So I'm going to draw out a couple of examples. Um, so what I want to do here is I'm going to say... Um, do that. And then let's suppose we choose a particular value of y. I'm going to start with, let's say y equals negative 10. Okay, so y equals negative 10. What is the sign of y minus xi? Okay, well, negative 10 minus 1, that's negative, so the sign would be negative 1. Negative 10 minus 3, that's obviously also negative. In fact, all of these are negative. 
So if y equals negative 10, then f prime of y, the derivative, which is the sum of all these sine functions, that would be, well, negative 1, negative 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. All right. What happens if y equals, let's choose 2. If y equals 2, what do we get? OK, let's see. So if y equals 2, I'll just erase all this stuff. If y equals 2, 2 minus 1, well, that's positive. So the sine is 1. 2 minus 3, that's negative. 2 minus 7 is negative. 2 minus 8, 2 minus 11, 2 minus 14 is negative. And so now the derivative is negative 4. Interesting. OK, so what if y equals, let's choose y equals 4. OK, if y equals 4, 4 minus 1, well, that's positive. 4 minus 3, that's positive. 4 minus 7, 4 minus 8, 4 minus 11, 4 minus 14, those are all negative. So the sum of the sine function here uh, would be, let's see, negative 2. Maybe you've already noticed the pattern. What if y equals, um, let's see, if y equals, well, how about we'll choose 7.5. 7.5, as it turns out, is the median as we've defined it up here. If y equals 7.5, then we end up with three positive signs, three negative signs, and that gives us zero. Huh, the derivative equals zero, weird. Uh, and then um, we'll do one more. Let's do, let's choose y equals 10. Well, if y equals 10, then y minus eight is positive. And so now our derivative equals two. Uh, and it turns out that uh, these three cases, so we, we've actually only been through two of the three cases. The third case is what happens if y is bigger than everything. But maybe you'll notice the pattern. Depending on where y falls in this ascending order, the, um, the value of this derivative changes, but it's monotonically increasing. As y goes from small to large values, the derivative just, it does still get bigger and bigger. It's true that there are some strange locations where it may not be defined, but it is, for the locations where it is defined, it is monotonically increasing. And it turns out, and the reasons for this, some of them are a little deeper than I want to get into, but it turns out we can still use the usual logic that if the derivative equals zero, and we can say certain other things about it, we can still find the global minimum of the original function. And in this case, um, because this equation and what I just demonstrated shows that the derivative is monotonically increasing, and, oh, there's a typo there, and that the derivative is less than or equal to zero for all points that are less than the median and greater than or equal to zero for all points that are greater than the median, it turns out that's enough for us to assume even if the derivative isn't defined at the actual median itself. Because the function is monotonically increasing, so it's, the derivative sort of looks like this. Um, because the derivative is monotonically increasing, whoops, uh, there will come a point where it crosses zero. And it doesn't make any difference if it's defined at that point. There's only going to be one such point, and that will be the global minimum of the function f. Because even if the derivative isn't defined at that point, the function f actually is. And that's sufficient to show that the median will, uh, that the function will attain its minimum at the median. Now, backing up for a minute, um, we saw the case where if y was equal to 7.5, it's a weird looking seven. If y is equal to 7.5, it turns out the derivative there is equal to, um, I gotta make sure I got my numbers here. Uh, the derivative there happens to equal zero. If y, is, if y is sitting right here, then the three things to the left are one, the three things to the right are negative one, those are equal to zero. So uh, 7.5 is the median, the median happens to set the derivative to zero. It's worth observing, if I chose y to be 7.1, the derivative would still be zero. And therefore, 7.1 also attains the global medium, median, uh, median, sorry, global minimum of our function f. There actually could be multiple points that attain that global minimum. The key here is all we were supposed to prove is that the median is one of those points. And therefore, the median is a, the, uh, an example of a choice for the best estimator if we are trying to minimize absolute error and not squared error. So I like this appetizer for so many different reasons, one of which is it ties together mean and median using, um, uh, I guess, uh, using optimization which I think is clever, I think it's, it's, it's apropos, but also it uses a couple of techniques that we're gonna come back to later. We're gonna see later in this lecture that there is this profound connection between these uh, minimizing squared error and absolute error. And additionally, we're gonna see later in this lecture that even though when we were working with the mean, we were talking about this quadratic function and, and talking about optimizing a quadratic um, function, we ended up solving a bunch of linear stuff to actually do the optimization because the derivative of a function that's only quadratic quadratic will be linear. That's going to be significant later when we talk about a certain kind of regression. In fact, it'll be least squares regression. But before we do that, let's get to the end of part one. So here's an example talking about mean versus median. So I have a data set here of eight 
And these are actual temperature observations from various weather stations around Victoria at exactly this time of morning on this date, this apparently arbitrary date. I wonder what day you made the slides, Bill. So um, these are eight actual temperature observations. And as we may often want to do, I might say, here's, I don't know, a thousand observations from around town. What is the temperature in town? Your job is to produce the temperature shown on people's weather app right now. What is the temperature in Victoria right now? So you're asked to take this data and nothing else and to give a single temperature value that represents the temperature in Victoria at this time. So when I say you're giving nothing else, what I mean is that if you had other information, for example, the latitude and longitude that each observation was made, you might be able to compute some kind of weighted statistics. So you might observe, for example, that these two numbers were all computed within about 100 meters of each other. And therefore that this number, which was computed a kilometer away, should be treated a little bit differently. But we don't know anything else about these data besides their values. So you know nothing. Give me a single representative. Well, it turns out that the mean of the set is 13.9 and the median is 13.8. And the set is sort of well behaved. The elements are clustered around both. So either would work for that example. The issue is, as is often the case with observational data, there could be unusual stuff in the data set. Here's an example. It's the same data set with one extra thing added, the number 30. And the number 30 is a bit dangerous here. Um, so if you're uh, running a bunch of weather stations and you're collecting observational data, all sorts of weird stuff can happen. So for example, a sensor could fail, the network could fail, or some bit of hardware fails and you end up getting stale data. It sends you back an old observation or something. It could be that the sun is shining directly onto the sensor, although there should be a way to control for that to some extent. Um, it, it could also be somebody's tampering with it. Somebody might notice that there's a weather station at a particular place and you know, I get out a hair dryer and blow it on the weather uh, on the sensor to try and increase the temperature. If it were just a matter of did the sensor fail, well, if you've worked with sensors before, you might know that if the sensor failed, it either it, it, usually whatever is collecting the data would notice this and send back a deliberately erroneous value. So it might say, okay, the temperature at this location is negative 999. And if you got that, you would of course delete that from your data set. There is no way that's a valid temperature in Celsius. The problem is there could be outliers that are the result of other malfunctions that are plausible. And the key thing is, this is a plausible outdoor temperature. It does indeed sometimes reach 30 degrees in Victoria, and it is the worst. And I know some of you are listening to this from parts of the world where it's like 40 degrees sometimes. And yes, I know that's also very hot, but I will observe to the extent that I'm, you know, a pampered suburbanite that thinks 30 degrees is a hot temperature. I will also point out that Victoria's 30 degrees, it's always a, a, a very muggy, moist heat. In some parts of the world where it gets to 40, it's dry heat. That seems to be way better. 30 degrees is the worst. In any case, 30 degrees is a valid temperature. And of course, if you've worked in data science before, you know that you have to be very careful when you throw away data. It's nice to use methods that can sort of internalize and, and internally handle strange outlying data points, as opposed to having to yourself clean the data and make decisions based on assumptions for when to throw away an observation, to decide when something is an outlier. And there are lots of other more formal techniques for finding and eliminate outli eliminating outliers. The one I want to talk about here is elegant because it sort of captures, it, it's captured somehow in the computations of means and medians. So the element 30 is clearly an outlier if we look at it, but it's not necessarily justified to just throw it right out because it is a legitimate temperature. Maybe for some reason on this day, there was a weather station that was pulling in a legitimate observation of 30 degrees. So what do we do? Well, let's consider the effect that that outlier had on the mean and median. Knowing what we now know about means, so we know that the mean is connected somehow to the sum of squared errors of our observation. It's minimizing the sum of squared errors. That means that if an error term gets large, the mean will have to move towards that, um, towards that observation to try and compensate. If one of the squared errors is big, then there is an incentive for the mean to change so that, so that it can reduce that squared error. Whereas the median, which is based on absolute error, certainly any estimator will have a large error compared to this data point. The difference is the larger the error is, the more the mean changes. Um, and we can see here that the mean and median for the original data set were very close together. When I add this one outlier, so one point out of nine, the mean changes dramatically and the median barely changes at all. Notice that the new mean is larger than almost every other point. There's only one legitimate observation that is larger than the new mean. 
and this and of course the outlier. So the mean changed a lot because of one outlier. And it's very common for data sets to contain outliers for all sorts of reasons. And that is one reason why in cases where you can expect your data set may contain strange anomalies like outliers, the median can often be a much better way to capture the underlying character of the data set. That's one reason why you should be very careful not to believe when you only hear about the mean of a data set to believe something about its character. That said, there are plenty of ways in which the median doesn't tell you everything. If you're only asking for one number, you're not going to get everything you want anyway. So this is an appetizer. The reason I think it's a good idea is first, it's a great application of optimization, but second, we are now going to recapitulate all of the arguments I've just made, talking about uh, larger data sets, talking about data sets in multiple dimensions, talking about things like curve fitting, and we'll of course start on doing that in part two.